Hello and welcome to RIT Sports Zone. I'm John DeTulio. And I'm Kristen Clock. After spending most of last year atop the college hockey world, RIT is back in familiar territory this season. The women's team has raced out to a perfect 12-0 record and have once again earned the number one ranking in the nation. RIT facing Chatham University at Ritter Arena. and This was a mismatch right from the start. 16 different Tigers recorded at least one point, including Kim Schlatman, who led the Tigers with a career-high seven points on two goals and five assists. RIT swept the weekend series 15-0 and 14-1. Well, after being juggled around the professional ranks for the last year, former RIT goaltender Jared DeMichael decided to call it quits and accept an offer from the man who helped bring him to campus six years ago. Emily Clark explains how Jared became coach DeMichael this fall. What exactly is your new position at RIT? Currently, I'm the women's hockey assistant coach. Um, I work with the goalies, but I also work with the uh, defensemen as well. I'm also doing recruiting and scouting. Everyone thinks that I'm just the goalie coach, but I am here working with all the other girls. Uh, game day, I've been running the defense and stuff like that. Uh, Chelsea Walklin and I have been doing a lot of film and recruiting together. So when uh, the girls come in on visits, we've been taking around and showing them the school. Well, all, all three of us, uh, Scott McDonald as well, we've all gelled really well, so hopefully it keeps going strong. You were actually the one who recruited Jarrett back when he started to play for the men's team. How do you feel your personal relationship is really going to positively affect the coaching? It only helps. You know, uh, he's, uh, I, I met him when he was a, a young guy playing junior hockey. Uh, I know the family very well and, uh, you know, was on the staff when we were recruiting him. But uh, um, just knowing someone on that level and then uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, before he came into school, about a week before he got to school, I switched to the women's team. Uh, but we always had a great relationship with each other throughout the uh, throughout his four years, and uh, you know just develop a, a personal relationship. Uh, you can bounce things off of each other. Now working together, um, literally have the office beside each other and our the connecting door, and we don't even shut it. Um, where you just we're in and out of each other's office the whole time. You know we respect each other, we trust each other, and um, regardless of he's only been coaching for two months, you know I, I trust in his judgment how to handle the players. Um, on the ice already, you know, it's the first day, the first drill, he was doing it. So um, I know he can get it done. If, if, he, if I didn't think so, we wouldn't have asked him to join us. Why exactly did you choose to give up your professional career and what was the process of coming to coach at RIT? It's definitely a difficult decision to stop playing. Uh, it just came down to that I knew of other players that had been bouncing around uh, and kind of saw the writing on the wall that I wasn't really going to have much of a home for more than a few weeks or a month. I didn't really see that as being fun. Uh, I was packing up my car more than I was playing hockey. And if you're playing professional hockey, you want to be playing professional hockey. You don't want to be packing up your car. And I was just, it wasn't fun. And uh, mentioned to the coaches at RIT going into the summer that, hey, like when I'm done playing, I might think about doing coaching. I mentioned to Scott McDonald as well. And he was like, hey, well, if things don't work out, keep us in mind. And I thought this was the best place to get some good experience and learn from some great people. And obviously, I, I missed RIT a little bit, so it's good to come back and see some familiar faces. Now, of anybody, everybody else you could have brought in as an assistant coach, why did you really choose Jared? Um, I think it goes back to knowing him on a personal level um, when we first recruited him on to the men's team. And uh, the, the trust issue is that that knowing you can put him on the ice, I don't have to, you know, if I'm doing something with a, a a line or something at the other end. I, I have the utmost respect and trust in him that he's going to get it done and I, I don't have to look you know, over my shoulder to make sure he's getting it done. How do you feel it is on the other side? You know, now you're the coach, not the one being coached. It's definitely different, um, but being a former player, you always try to put yourself in the player's shoes. You learn that the coaches put in a lot of hours that you don't know about. There's a lot of things that go into it. The whole athletic department, administration, stuff like that, they put a lot of time into it. So it's definitely, um, I didn't know how, how much hard work and effort that Coach Wilson and Coach Hills and Coach Inslaco put in with the men's team. So I'm finding that out every single day, but I, I've enjoyed it thus far and uh, I'm thinking I'm gonna continue to enjoy it.
Welcome back to Sports Zone. The RIT men's hockey team closed out the calendar year on home ice with a pair of games against American International. He's got the long goal this evening for the AIC Yellow Jackets. AIC RIT took the first game three to one. In the second game, it was tied at one in the third when the Tigers got it going. Mike Kolovecchia, Scott Knowles, and Matt Garbowski all scored for the Tigers in a span of just over four minutes to secure a 4-2 victory. RIT doesn't return home to Ritter Arena until January 27th when they host two games against Mercyhurst. Tyler Brenner could have been an RIT Tiger again this season, but like Steve Pinizzato and Chris Tanev, Brenner decided to forego his remaining eligibility. As Shelby Hill discovered, Brenner just couldn't pass up the opportunity to sign with the organization he grew up idolizing. Tyler Brenner didn't have a lot of time to dwell on the way the Tigers' season came to a close last year. Because just days after his RIT career ended, he moved on to the pros. Unfortunately, we lost a big game here against the Air Force. Um, as a game, I won't forget it. it was my last game, and it was here. But uh, then uh, the transition happened pretty quickly. I got a couple phone calls from different teams. And uh, I think the next day I was off to Toronto and um, I was on the road to Grand Rapids. So it was a quick transition, but uh, it, was, uh, it was sad to see the guys go and, and leave RAT, but it, it was nice to move on as well. Brenner signed with the NHL's Maple Leafs and was assigned to their AHL team in Toronto. Now why did you choose Toronto? Um, grew up cheering for the team my whole life. Uh, everybody back home cheers for the Leafs, so it was a pretty easy decision for me, and I'm glad I did it. Uh, it's a great organization. we got a great group of guys here, and the coaches are fantastic, so I'm glad to be here. Well, our, uh, our scouts and our, our management staff were out looking at uh, high-end free agents, and uh, we're a team that is always active in that market, and uh, Tyler came across the radar as a, a very hard-working, uh, dedicated, physical young man. Um, and he also had some great numbers to back them up. So uh, that put him in a positive light immediately. But Brenner's opportunity required a whole new outlook on how to prepare for stiffer competition and a much longer season. He's a kid that we actually had to ask him to train a little smarter this summer. He, he's such a hardworking guy that he was overtraining. And uh, our strength staff had to get with him and kind of restructure his, uh, his schedule to, to pull him back. So number one, he's a hardworking guy. Um, you know, it's his first year in the league here, and and he's trying to make an identity for himself. And uh, but when he's at his best, he's playing very physical. Uh, he's just basically going up and down his wing, and he's putting everything at the net. The Tyler has an excellent, excellent shot, an excellent release, and and I think at some point he's going to be a goal scorer in this league. This season's a lot different. It's a lot longer. There's. I don't know what, there's 34 games in a college season and 82 here, so it's a big transition. And I think the way that you build yourself up for a college season and work throughout the summer, it, it allows you to last for 30 games. But I think I might have been overdoing myself, so just kind of slow it down a bit and make sure that I was uh, ready for the long season instead of, you know, working myself a little too hard in the off season and maybe wearing myself out before the year ended here. Even though Tyler Brenner has seen limited ice time in his first season with Toronto, the Marlies believe he has tremendous potential. Are we going to see him on the ice a lot more this season? Well, yeah, you know, it, it's been a slow start for him. We've had a, uh, a, a ton of forwards and guys with experience, so it's taken a little bit to uh, get him in the lineup. But uh, I just actually just talked to him today, and, and he's played very, very well over the last three games. His, his last game that he played was the best that he's played since he's been here. Now, his numbers don't back it up right now, but uh, if he continues to play like he did last game, uh, it will be very hard to take him out of the lineup. He will definitely be one of our regulars, and, and the numbers will come. It's just like coming into college again uh, as a freshman or a new guy around the team. Uh, get a feel for the league and you know uh, get some experience and play with the older guys and, and uh, you know, learn things from them, and you gotta you gotta build yourself and work yourself into the lineup and prove to them that you can play. So I think that's just what I'm doing here. You know, just go out each game and do the best you can, and your opportunities will come. We we see an NHL potential in him, and uh, it'll be you know just a question if he grows or not. Um, 
just getting to know the kid and with with his work ethic and his and his dedication uh, I certainly know those things aren't going to be a problem sometimes you get kids with unbelievable talent uh, they they tell you they want to be an NHL player they like the idea of being an NHL player but they don't want to put the work in uh, where Tyler firmly is going to put the work in um, and you know we'll see where, where he gets to but th this will be a big year for him Welcome back to Sports Zone. It's one of the most physically and mentally demanding sports, but despite the long and sometimes chilly morning practices on the Genesee, we discovered there's no place Fielding Confer would rather be. My name is Fielding Confer, and I'm about ready to uh, run the crew practice. It's uh, 5.05 .05 in the morning, and uh, this is the start of my usual day. Basically the reason we have to get up at 5 in the morning is because nobody has class at 5 in the morning. Having a practice later in the day would kind of prevent um, everyone from being in the boats. And the most important part about crew is everyone kind of meshing together. I feel like you're being strong. You guys are jerks. <laughs> with crew there's definitely a lot of terms that we'll use. So with rowing, the four most important terms are um, bow, stern, port, and starboard. Um, starboard is the right side of the boat, port's the left. Uh, bow is the front and then stern is the, uh, the back of the boat. So it's just kind of really important to understanding like where you are in the boat and what position you're sitting in. Seven comes after. It's going to be a good morning. <laughs> so based on the boats, eight rowers will, will sit in them. Uh, they each have sliding seats. If you can see kind of up in here, this little guy is, little, is what you sit on and they slide back and forth. And take the stroke, it just push. All right. um, and then, it, so there's eight rowers and there's one coxswain. They motivate your rowers, um, which is very important. Um, to push yourself harder uh, is definitely helpful if you have someone screaming at you through a microphone and they steer the boat as well because there's a small rudder on the back. So it's uh, a lot of responsibility on the coxswains, which is what a lot of people underlook. If you get a, if you get a boat going together, um, you hear a certain click in the oarlocks and it's like, it's just like a, a slide and then a boom when like you, you feather the blade. It is kind of serene, and it, um, it sounds pretty cool. Like it's almost like you're a Viking ship, just like in the middle. You're in the middle of the dark, and you're just going through, and you, all you hear is like the slide, boom, and then slide, boom, and you just keep hearing it. It's kind of weird because rowing is such a. I've never been in a sport that's been so, um, so selfless. Where everyone in the boat, they're they're all there's so many personalities in that boat. You all have to kind of come together as a unit. Which is why when you don't have a certain lineup together all at once, like consistently, it's kind of tough to, to get into the flow of it. So what's up next? Uh, right now I'm just kind of running back to, uh, to the dorms or to my apartment and then going to class and just try to have a regular day, I guess. I do homework. All right. <laughs> well, I'm a chemical engineering major, and um, class is, I guess, a little difficult at times, but uh, I like it. Right now, the class I'm heading to is, um, is a lab, actually. It's uh, my first chemical engineering lab. It kind of just goes over a lot of uh, different techniques we'll use out in the field. And uh, when you're ready, you can start uh, pulling the instructions and doing the first step. With chemical engineering, the frustrating thing about it was uh, I didn't know coming in really what you can do as a chemical engineer but from my understanding what I can do with chemical engineering um, is basically just you know analyze processes um, come up with different ways to you know make materials um, honestly I honestly I don't really know what I want to do with it yet um, for my first co-op I'll probably keep it open to anything and just get some experience and see what I like does it feel like it's only like 10 o'clock to you? I don't know. I've gotten so used to it now that like I don't understand regular like time anymore. <laughs> like it's just funny like when people are like I'm so tired and like I think about it. Most people have been up for like two hours and I'm like I've been up for five hours right now. It's just like weird. And now I'm about to ready to head into um, uh, reaction engineering which is like our core main class for our major and it sounds bland but there's some pretty cool application to it so bear with me I guess. Is the best thing I could say. All right, let's go. All right. 
it doesn't sound very fun. I'm not gonna lie, but it, it, there is kind of cool things about it. Like my professor is just a really excited guy. He's really good. He's the head of our department. Really into what he does, and um, he does a good. He has a good way of exciting us about it. And S Gen is the reaction, and S in and S out of the specific spe specific species. Okay. It's four o'clock. Yeah, it's almost four o'clock. Two minutes to four. You've been up for uh, ten hours, eleven hours, eleven hours. Yep. I feel pretty tired. <laughs> <laughs> but usually from two to four, when I have like that class, I get real tired. But. I usually have to get like a cup of coffee or something. Well, I don't have to, but it's nice <laughs> to get one. Do you have any other hobbies here, Darcy? Um, other hobbies? I'm trying to think of what else I do. I mean, I'm in like the some groups, like the uh, the chemical engineering group. The cruise kind of takes up quite a bit of your time. Last year, I didn't really have a chance to get into many other hobbies other than the crew and school because I had kind of a lot of other things going on, which is a whole other story in itself. Um, but last year, I actually. Uh, uh, went through uh, cancer treatment for, for seven months. So it was a pretty serious time, but and it, everyone helped, school helped. It was just kind of like, um, definitely gave me motivation to do what I do, yeah. but uh, literally my second day of practice was actually when I was diagnosed. For five weeks before that was pretty tough, and then the second day of practice, uh, I finally I got my biopsy results back and I went into an appointment, and he was like, yes, he's like, I think you have this. I'm like, okay. And that day was actually probably the most relieving days because I knew what I was up against. It was curable. It was uh, something they were, you know, positive and upbeat about. One of the first things I thought about was, oh, like, am I going to be able to row? Or like, like this is like stupid little things like that. But now I kind of realize, I mean, those really are the important things. Because the hardest part really about the whole thing was having to tell, um, having to tell like my friends, my family, you know, it's just something hard to tell them. So by doing what I did, I just kind of felt like it helped, um, to help show them that I was going to be fine. And I was in a good state of mind. The crew team really didn't know about it since I just joined. Uh, I just didn't want to tell them, not, not because I didn't trust them or anything, or I was embarrassed, I just, I didn't want to be known as that guy, like, I didn't want to be pitied for it. Um, so I didn't really tell them for a while, and I, I did tell them two, two and a half months later. And I only told the novice guys, because those are the ones I was mainly dealing with, and um, it was a pretty interesting thing to tell them. But um, the guy I actually walked by earlier was, was, was there when I said it, and he was just like, no one really knew what to say. So he, he was the first one to act up, and he was just like, what the hell, man? <laughs> it was the only thing he could think of, and I mean, it kind of summed it up perfectly. They were there for me even when they didn't realize it, and um, I, I really owed them a lot. And I, I don't even think they realized how much I owed them. Um, but I, I just, I never really had a way to tell them, so. No rush! <laughs> okay. All right, so I uh, just finished up doing my math technique homework. I've been hanging out at the gym for a little bit, just getting in a workout in later in the day. Um, for the most part, after my four o'clock class, or after my two o'clock class, um, I'll try to get like another workout in. Um, it's, sometimes it's not a good idea to go really hard on a, a week, especially since this week is uh, leading up to our last race, so I don't want to go real hard and just get real tired for it. Um, but usually core exercises are good because you recover quick from them. And uh, just a few erg pieces, nothing crazy, uh, to just kind of prepare and get focused. All right, so I just uh, finished my light workout. Um, probably just gonna go hang in the pool for a little while, cool down, and uh, head back to my dorm. Finish up maybe homework if I have anything that I wanna do, or I'll get some food, and then I think uh, I'll get up and do it again tomorrow. Till next time, guys. Each year, RIT Athletics honors its past by recognizing the most outstanding athletes, coaches, and contributors to sports here in the Brick City. Well, this year, for the first time in the Hall of Fame history, an entire team was inducted. The 1955-56 men's basketball squad is still the only hoops team at RIT to go undefeated. The Tigers went 17-0 that season, averaging a school record 89.2 points per game. As Jeff Blassett reports, the team of the ages was enshrined along with six other former RIT greats. To cap off a successful Brick City homecoming weekend, 
RIT honored its athletic pioneers. The 2011 class of the RIT Sports Hall of Fame was honored here at the Locust Hill Country Club. Can we go into the process a little bit about how athletes are chosen to be inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame? Well, each year we get um, nominations. Uh, so we have to sift through the nominations and we try and get somebody from every sport. And then once we have that, we put together a ballot. The ballot goes out and anybody that's currently in the Hall of Fame or an athletics employee is able to vote. We tally the votes, uh, top two are in, and then the committee makes decisions after that. How does it feel to be inducted into the RIT Sports Hall of Fame? It feels really good. I mean, it's a great accomplishment. It's a great honor to be inducted uh, along with all these other inductees. It's uh, an amazing feeling and I had a lot of people who uh, helped me get here so it was nice to see them all here today and uh, be here on my behalf. It's a great honor, especially going in with the uh, undefeated 55 and 56 team and, and all the other great athletes that were inducted. You know, it's an individual honor, but it couldn't happen without your team. Um, that was the general theme of today. And, um, you know, I wish I could bring my whole team in with me because they were the, probably the most important part of the whole experience. Um, but it's definitely... It's quite an honor. It's a tough process, you know, every year harder and harder because um, the way the athletic program's growing uh, and the competition levels, we seem to, to keep rising to the level of competition and producing more great academic All-Americans and All-Americans. So everybody's got a great resume. It's very hard to sift through. What was your favorite moment playing here at RIT? Um, probably sophomore year going to the NCAAs when we made it to the Sweet 16. It would have been my senior year, just all of my accomplishments my senior year. Um, going to nationals and everything being the fastest in the nation. So as far as RIT, I mentioned in my speech that it's the facility, it's the field house. I love the field house. I love the pool. I feel like they made the pool for me to get better and it definitely made a difference. I probably if I had to pick one game and moment would be when we were in the Sweet 16 in 1997 and uh, even though it was a loss, uh, the guys played great. I would say just playing with my teammates, uh, you know, they were all great lacrosse players and uh, a lot of them will be future Hall of Famers as well. So just going to practice every day and having fun with each of those guys. Well, I mean, there's so many memories. Uh, I, it's very difficult to pick one, but uh, ironically, probably the best memory was the final game. Unfortunately, we did lose, but for me, that was just to make it to that far and undefeat up until that point was probably the biggest uh, accomplishment. How do you feel about the growth of the athletic program since you started working on this committee here at RIT? Um, we're growing, we're getting better and better, uh, we're putting more resources towards it. So uh, RIT is continually bettering itself academically and athletically. There's not a better place to be if you're going to be going to college. RIT is going to prepare you better than anything else. If you're going to be going on in your sport, uh, we have the coaches there that can prepare you for that. But um, we are great with facilities, people, and talent. RIT is the best spot. Well, that does it for this edition of RIT Sports Zone. Don't forget, we're always on at RITSC.com. So until next time, thanks for joining us in the zone.